So uh, I'll tell you about this today. Uh, I want you to think about photosynthesis, though. So we, you've been listening to a lot about science, about photosynthesis. But I don't know if you've ever thought about it conceptually, deeply. So it, what photosynthesis does is it takes light. I have trouble getting my hands around light. It takes air and water. That's the starting material, sunlight, air, and water. And it builds this entire world, it makes hard stuff. And so a few years ago, we started wondering, we are only going to have the same starting material, sunlight, air, and water. That, that will be the only starting materials we'll allow ourselves to use. And we wondered if we could do this. And there's a reason for that. So when we've been talking about this conference before I get going, uh, this, now you'll see I moved from MIT to Harvard because I have to have a humanist element to my talks. Uh, at MIT, you just surround nerds all the time, so it's a fine. Uh, but I want to I want to talk because if you thought I put the slide in yesterday because everything we've been talking about really is about the world that we see. And there's this word right here. This is a philosophical uh, idea. It's called solipsism. This is worse than being egocentric. So what it is solipsistic is right now, none of you actually exist. So it's a philosophical idea. And the only reason you exist to me right now is I've allowed you to in my mind to see you. <laughs> but you absolutely don't exist. And that's how we do energy, because that's the world we live in. And when we interpret energy in the things we've been talking about is in the world that we see and that we exist in. And that's three billion of you in that green circle. But there's six billion that we don't see, the poor. And they're outside of our circle. And so everything we've been talking about, the grid and centralized infrastructures, that's great but you're leaving out 200% of the world, and that's the poor, and you want to take care of them. So obviously, it's a moral imperative. You should take care of the poor. You should worry about them. But that's not going to be my message today. It's pragmatic imperative. If you don't take care of the poor, I guarantee you can't have a sustainable planet. Okay, because there's six billion people who have to make a future energy decision. And they could choose what you've done and what we've done in the developed world, or they could choose a different path. So they're going to be your hope for the future. You guys are stuck. You're stuck with this huge paid off infrastructure. But the poor are going to teach the world what the future should look like. And I'm going to, I, I'll just tell you without doing any calculations, right now the world is, you can think about the world having a 16 trillion watt light bulb on. It's on all the time, and you've got to give it energy, and around 80% is fossil fuels. You've been hearing that during this conference. In the next few years, you're going to need around 16 trillion watt equivalents of energy more. So you're going to have a 32 trillion watt light bulb. And when you do the calculation, that calculation assumes that in 35 years you're going to save every bit of energy you use today. So that's kind of weird because you're going to be the most responsible citizens in the world and save all your energy. So why would you need this much more? And it gets down to the fact that there's 1.6 billion people that haven't seen an electron in a wire. There's 1.4 billion low energy users, so there's 3 billion. And then in the next 35 years, 3 billion more people are going to be born into the world, and they're being born in the parts of the world where they don't have energy. So that's where the new 6 billion energy users are coming from, and that's what's driving that number. And if you want to have a sustainable planet, you better hope they don't do what you did. So that's been our motivation, is can we give energy to this part of the world. I call it non-legacy, meaning you have a legacy. You've inherited wires in the ground, and buildings have a legacy energy infrastructure. But the poor haven't. They don't really have a legacy yet. They get to choose what their future is.
you don't. That's already been predetermined. Like I said, you're stuck with it. Now, everything I'm going to tell you today, we can already do. So we can split water. We can say it's too expensive. I don't believe that at all. The reason it's too expensive is I'm doing a calculation with some economists at Chicago. Just in your fossil fuel infrastructure, you've spent $17 trillion in America, and it's paid off. So it's a paid off $17 trillion investment. That's why you're stuck in America using that. And a different way to think about it is if you went back 100 years and you said you could choose the path of fossil fuels or everything you heard today, it would be, it would be cheaper to choose what we heard today. But so what you're really fighting is this massive centralized paid off infrastructure. And with that, I can split water to hydrogen and oxygen. I can take CO2 to CO, and then I can take CO with hydrogen and fissure tropes and make gasoline. I can take nitrogen to ammonia. I can do all that, but I need a large centralized infrastructure, and I need a distribution system. And that's expensive. You can't do any of that in your backyard. So the only interest we have is, can I do everything you do with a large centralized infrastructure in your backyard? And if you're in your backyard, what do you really have? You have only a few things, sunlight, air, and water. So now you see why those are our only starting materials. And if you want to do that, being in the backyard is good for the poor, since they don't have a big centralized infrastructure, they have a backyard. There's another reason for using solar. You've been hearing about carbon. There's a, there's a better reason for us. If you're poor or the richest person in the world, when you look up, you have access to the same energy supply. So it's an indiscriminate energy supply, in effect, that everybody has access to. You could be distributed, it's available to all, but you, you have to have things that are what are called low capital expenditure. And I'm going to say if you have to have one plus two plus three, you better not have complicated engineering, because complicated engineering costs money at the end of the day. And what I want to show you is why am I saying don't no, have complicated engineering. Here's the manufacturing curve. And all I did, this is how I do research now. I, I don't know how anything in my lab works, but I go to Google, and I make Google plots. And then I run into the lab, and I say to my students, look what I just discovered. So, and then they, as you get older, they just walk you back to the lab. They say, your office, they say, sit here. We'll keep doing important work. So uh, since you're a captured audience, you're going to hear my discovery from Google. Uh, and all I did is I took a Boeing 777 and said, how much did it weigh? And I divided the cost by the weight. And so you get this curve, and this is a manufacturing curve. This works for energy systems, the things you build. It doesn't work for IT. You can put a few kids in a room off of the Harvard Yard, and they can come up with Facebook or Microsoft work. That's low capital expenditure. That's why VCs invest in IT, they put a little money in, they want billion dollar out. It doesn't work for pills, pharma. Why doesn't it work for pills? It's kind of expensive to do pharma, but when you invest in pharma, do you ever think of what you're really investing in? Hope. I have the magic pill to cure cancer. You guys will pay anything for that. When you get to energy, you don't plug the you don't, when you put the wire in the, the, the socket, you're not hoping electricity comes out, right? So you have no hope, and it's high capital expenditure. So no hope, high capital expenditure, this is how you build machines. And it works for anything that you manufacture a lot. This is no joke. You finally get to low, the lowest price is $10 per pound. I don't care what you make at a high throughput manufacturing. By the way, McDonald's has a CTO, chief technology officer. I didn't know that, but I found him. I have no idea what the technology is in a McDonald's hamburger, but he exists. And he told me if you take the weight of the patty, the tomato, it comes out to $10 per pound. A Big Mac is a $10 per pound manufactured item. So all of a sudden, that's looking like an automobile. 
What's this? This is how we do energy. It's centralized. It's one big heavy thing, and when you multiply by $10 per pound, it comes out to a few billion dollars, and you've got to put wires in the ground. So we have a centralized infrastructure. We don't have this type of infrastructure. So what's the reverse thought experiment? Let's not worry about energy. Let's think about if McDonald's had a business model the way we do energy. Do you ever think what that would look like? They would make one huge hamburger. You would all drive to it, take a bite out of it, and then go back home. And so we started thinking, how about if we come up with a energy system that doesn't look like that, but looks like a McDonald's hamburger? Now, I already told you what's lightweight, one plus two plus three. Lightweight, low capex, available to all, and that's a leaf. This is photosynthesis. You take sunlight and split water to oxygen and hydrogen. That's what you use the sun for in the leaf. You don't use it for this part that we all think about, CO2 plus hydrogen to biomass. That's done in the dark. So the place the leaf is using energy is in water splitting. That's why you keep hearing about water splitting at this conference. Once you have the hydrogen, and nature stores hydrogen in solid form, NADPH, it combines with carbon dioxide and it makes biomass. That's done in the dark. So we decided this is the type of model we wanted to build, a hamburger that would use the sunlight to split water to oxygen and hydrogen, and then we'll figure out what we'll do in the dark to get biomass. Now, what's the fuel? You've been hearing a lot about fuels. There's gasoline, carbon, 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 hydrogen. There's oxygen. So you have high energy content bonds, and when you burn the fuel, you make a low energy content, CO2 and water, and then you take the extra energy. Okay, watch this again. This is 18 hours of PowerPoint to get this to happen. Here, watch. Try doing that at home. Okay. Uh, so what's the leaf doing? The leaf is taking low energy content bonds in water, and then the sunlight is getting stored in the rearranged bonds of water to make oxygen and hydrogen. So you've stored sunlight in the bonds of hydrogen and oxygen, and those are chemical fuels. That's what's happened here, too, but it's done it over millions of years in photosynthesis in the ground. So that's what a fuel is. So you can think of it as stored or bottled sunlight in the form of high energy bonds. If I told you you need 16 terawatts, I know how much energy is in a, in a mole of water, and therefore a liter. Uh, the hardest part of this calculation was figuring out how many liters are in that pool at Harvard. But say I could make an energy system, and you've heard people talk about them, and we operated on that pool of water per second globally. Now, you don't use the water up, because after you split it, right, you recombine it, you get the water back. So you're not using the water up. You're cycling it, and you're just doing an energy conversion. Sunlight in, fuel, store it burn the fuel, get water back. If you globally operated on that pool of water per second with sunlight, 38 terawatts. So that's why the plant went and looked at water as its energy source or storage source, because you store a lot of energy in the bonds of hydrogen and oxygen. So when you hear, heard Steve's talk yesterday, that's why everybody's interested in water, and that's what the front end of photosynthesis. Now, here's the part that works with the sun in photosynthesis, the photosynthetic membrane, and I'm going to talk about it now more from a systems engineering point of view, not biology. So sunlight comes into the plant. I told you it's hard to get your hands around sunlight. And so the plant does exactly what we do in the technical world, technological world. We convert photons into moving charge, and that's current. So leaves are buzzing with electricity. They just don't have wires. But they are moving charge, and they do one unit of charge separation with the photon. But water splitting is four electrons and four protons in that bond rearrangement. And so it has to do it four times. It stores the four units of charge. The positive charge is stored in a 
cofactor called the oxygen evolving complex. It's a manganese cluster. That splits the water to O2. The electrons get transported to the other side of the membrane. There's a thing called an iron reductase that takes the four electrons and protons, and they make hydrogen, but in the form of NADPH, not gaseous hydrogen. So we thought the same thing. Could we make something, have wireless charge with sunlight, We'll separate the charge one unit at a time, pass the charge to coatings, say on silicon, and then split that to make hydrogen and oxygen. And then we'll figure out somehow how we're going to do this next step with CO2, but I don't need sunlight for that anymore. I can do that in the dark. Now, I want to tell you what you really do as a scientist in doing that problem. We spent most, I spent most of my life just trying to understand this. If you don't couple and have electrons talk to protons very well, you put in super big energy barriers. So if I need to go from here to here for hydrogen and from here to here to make oxygen, I waste all this energy because I had to climb up the hill and come down the hill. And that's what happens when protons and electrons don't talk to each other. You waste energy. And I don't want to go into this piece, but you, you know electrons are quantum mechanical. They spread out. The mass of the proton is 2,000 times out of the electron. It can't spread out as far. So if I have an electron and a proton and I have to have them talk to each other, that's called the, in physics the incommensurate length scale problem. The proton can't tunnel as far as the electron. The other way to think about it is, so then how are you going to study this? And we did that for years so that we wouldn't have big energy barriers. We had to figure that out. And the way you study it, say I had to race against Usain Bolt in a 100-meter dash. You think I'm going to lose, but I'm going to cheat. If that's the finish line, I'm going to start one step from the finish line, and I'm going to make Usain Bolt start there. And he still will beat me, so I'll get a little closer. And then finally, when the gun goes off, you use a laser, the elect electron and proton get to the finish line at the same time. And when they do, you can use instruments to see how they talk to each other. And once we did that, and I worked with Bob here, we developed the first theories to talk about how electrons and protons. So that's what we spent most of our life doing. Nothing uh, that I'm going to tell you at the end. That's what I spent 25 years of my life trying to do. Once we had that down, we could make this catalyst. It has cobalt and oxygen. It self-assembles from water. And that can then manage these protons and electrons and then the dance that they're coordinated so you have a low energy barrier to make oxygen. We have protons left over, and we made another catalyst to combine them to make hydrogen. Now, in developing this, we did one special thing. We made these catalysts self-healing. Now, why did we need to do that? Because if you're poor, and I have to distribute clean water to do water splitting, I'm in trouble. I want to be able to use a puddle of water off the ground. And so <clears throat> what you need is most catalysts will decompose or corrode in, in dirty water. So we spent a lot of time developing this catalyst because it's self-healing. And the way you can think about it is that blue line, we figured out how the catalyst works, but that blue line says how well the catalyst splits water at this voltage. If I put 1.2 volts on that cobalt catalyst, it splits water to O2. The red line is the voltage you need to assemble the catalyst that self-assembles from water. You put current through the water, the catalyst deposits and starts working. So look at like at pH 7, neutral water. If I'm at 1.2 volts and I'm splitting water to O2, I have plenty of voltage. I only need one volt to have the catalyst self-assemble. So if the catalyst starts decomposing and I'm using, say, dirty water, uh, what else could you use? Urine, right? Because that's always available. So we've run it out of urine. Why would you do that? Because available water. The other reason is you take your most annoying graduate student who was Yogi at the time. And I said, Yogi, you're doing the urine experiments. That's how you get back at it. So 
you can split this water and you can use it in any cattle, uh, any water source. And what we did, this is how catalyst chemists usually make catalysts. They deactivate and then you chemically reactivate them. What we did here is we put an equilibrium in the within the energetic cycle of the catalyst operating. So it never has to leave the cycle as it's running around here doing its job splitting water to O2. There's plenty of energy for it to keep fixing itself. So there may be pieces of the catalyst that are messed up over here, but then a piece over there has re-self-assembled itself and it keeps on working. And that means our usually use this thing called turnover number. How many times does the catalyst go before it dies? This catalyst, which is a true self-healing catalyst, has an infinite turnover number. So you can use things like the Boston Harbor, salt water. You can use the Charles River, wastewater. You can take a puddle from the ground. So now if I have to do something in your backyard, I don't want to have to be distributing water to you. So that was really important for us to do self-healing. When you're in water, it's easier to interface to materials than if you're in concentrated base or acid. And then finally, if you're in water, you can start interfacing to biology because I don't, trees don't grow in concentrated base or acid. And so the self-healing was the second thing that we spent a lot of time working on to make that work. And once it did that, you open up these other areas. Now, these catalysts, if you've noticed, I keep saying you need 1.2 volts or 1.3 volts. You need an external voltage, and they don't absorb light. So that was a problem. We have some pretty good catalysts that split water to oxygen and hydrogen, but they don't absorb light. So how do you do that? And that's what this is. This is called a buried junction. It's because this is silicon, just like you've been hearing about for solar panels. And then you get charge that separates, and you put wires on the silicon and collect the charge. Now what we'll do is not collect the charge in a current externally, like you use a solar panel. We'll pass the charge, just like I said before, it will be wireless, and the positive charge goes to the top, and the negative charge goes to the bottom. We'll do it one unit at a time, times four, and then that splits water to oxygen and hydrogen. And when we first did this, with a junky design, we were 10%. There, there's ohmic drops. There's all these things you have to worry about, but there's this group of people called engineers. They finally figure stuff out after scientists make discoveries. And I think you'll probably hear from Harry. Now people are using Berry junctions. And we're hitting 15%. My guess is, I don't know, something Harry and I could talk about at the end. We'll probably top out as a field at 20% is my guess by the time we're over. And that's sunlight to make split water to hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. And this is kind of nice because there's no extra weight. The, we can now make this all by chemical vapor deposition. We can make our catalyst by just vape, just basically you could think of glass but silicon. And then we put coatings on the silicon from the gas phase. So you can think about manufacturing things where you just have silicon flying by and you're spray coating the catalyst on top of them. You don't have to wire anything up. And this thing works, and it splits water to hydrogen and oxygen. I told you I wanted to make a hamburger. So here's the hamburger. The silicon is the meat. That coating there, you got to put that coating there because when you make oxygen, it can attack silicon and make sand, SiO2. So that's the cheese. And then the top catalyst is the top of the bun, and the bottom catalyst is the other bun. It's a hamburger that I can now pass out to the poor. And once you have the hamburger, you have sunlight, dirty water, you're good to go. And that's what this whole idea of berry junctions are. The other nice thing about a berry junction, it, it is like a sandwich. So if somebody comes up with a better, a higher efficiency PV, you just slap that in there. Somebody comes up with a better catalyst, you just slap that in there. It really is like a sandwich. It's very versatile, it's very modular. Okay, so we have hydrogen. So what, if I gave you hydrogen right now, what would you do with it? That's what you do. You would blow up balloons. 
because we don't have a big infrastructure for hydrogen. We could, but we haven't done that yet. And the biggest problem with hydrogen is distributing it. That's hard to do. But now you can start thinking about doing it locally. I actually think there will be a distributed hydrogen infrastructure driven, but it won't be this invention. It's going to be because people like the United States are fracking gas. And I can envision someday having just natural gas lines going into the gas station and you do a thing called steam reforming and make the hydrogen at the gas station. We can talk about that later. But right now, you don't have a hydrogen infrastructure. And that's what nature does. Hydrogen, I told you, is in the dark. You, you, once you make the hydrogen, you combine it with CO2 in the dark. The biomass is a hydrogen storage mechanism. It's not an energy storage mechanism. All the energy storage is in water splitting. And therefore, if you want to do this or make a fuel, it's hard. Now, what are the hard challenges of making a fuel? I just told you I spent almost 25, 30 years of my life to have four protons and four electrons talk to each other. Look at this one. This is isopentanol, 30 protons, 30 electrons. Gasoline, 50 protons, 50 electrons. I will be dead before I coordinate 50 protons with 50 electrons if it took me 30 years to do four. Okay? So that's hard. And the more increasing energy content, the more protons and electrons. You need to be selective. All of these compounds are made within 10 kcals of each other. And I could put another 100 molecules with CO2 plus hydrogen, all within a narrow energy window. And I want one thing. That's hard. But here's the biggest point. These are easy, really, chemically. You're just hydrogenating CO2. For a chemist, that's easy. You're just adding hydrogen to CO2. These are more difficult because you're making carbon-carbon bonds, like carbon, carbon bonds, like pearls on a string. You've got to string them together. So these three things really started to bother us. How are we going to do that? And that's where we turn to biology, because biology does, they manage, biology manages lots of protons and electrons. It can string carbons together, and it can be selective. So what we did is we took a bacterium. We had to make it eat hydrogen from the berry junction. So its only food source is going to be hydrogen. That's the only food the bacteria is going to eat. And then, so we have to put a nose on it. And then I can use genetics, and inside the bacteria, I can make factories. I can make genes and have the bacteria eat the hydrogen, and then have the hydrogen power the fa factory. And the question is, could you make a fuel? So here's the photosynthetic membrane I showed you up front where you're splitting water. I don't need that now, because you can use a berry junction. You make the hydrogen. But the bacteria needs to eat it. So you put a gene inside the bacteria that has an enzyme called hydrogenase. And a hydrogenase enzyme takes H2 to protons and electrons. And then we back end it with another enzyme, NADPH reductase. Once you have NADPH, I can make ATP. Once I have ATP, I can power things like a carbon cycle inside the bacterium. So that's what we did. You have your bacterium eating carbon from the air. It can concentrate it itself. It has carbonic anhydrases. I don't need to do carbon concentration. That's a natural enzyme, so it's just going to suck the carbon out of the atmosphere. It takes hydrogen as its food source, and it makes biomass. They just grow. They grow exponentially, and I could harvest the biomass. But I can get trickier at this branch point, acetyl coenzyme A, it's just this point in the biosynthetic pathway, I could put four more genes in. So I put these four genes. They each code for these different enzymes, and those enzymes do chemical steps. A ketodiolase breaks this bond on the acetyl coenzyme A and makes a carbon-carbon bond. It starts stringing carbons together. Then I can put this enzyme in. That adds water. I can decarboxylate. I can hydrogenate. This, this bug now starts making alcohols. And so what you do is you grow your bugs. This is like, I just put a pinch in. You can't even see them in water. You let them start eating hydrogen. They grow exponentially. Then we adjust the hydrogen in the four-gene pathway. 
This now goes steady state. Some bugs die, others are born, so they, their concentration stays the same. And then we take all the extra hydrogen and we send it along that pathway and it makes isopropanol. And it does it at 7.2%. That's light in to amount of alcohol made, which you could use as a fuel. Biomass goes, seven, goes to 10.2% if I just let them grow wildly. This is a plastic polyhydroxybutyrate. I'm going to show you why I need that in a minute. And then this one is isopentanol. That's that 30 proton, 30 electron fuel. That's a good one because that phase segregates from water. So isopropanol is miscible with water. The isopentanol I can just pour off from the water, so I don't have to do any chemical engineering to get the fuel. And inside the bug, the bug's making the fuel and excreting it. And you got to realize the best crops grow at 1%. So in an energy efficiency, we're a factor of 10 better than photosynthesis. Right? That means I don't need as much land. I'm one-tenth the land use. It's not like algae. Every algae has to see sunlight. My bugs are in the dark. They're just eating the hydrogen that was made from solar water splitting. I'm not competing with crops, so that's kind of nice. And this is important. I don't have complicated designs. I don't have to have CO2 concentration. I don't have to have large surface areas where everybody sees sunlight, so that's kind of nice. So you can think about now doing this in your backyard. So I can do Fisher tropes, but I don't need a large centralized power plant. What else is in air? Nitrogen. And it turns out you use a lot of energy to make fertilizer, to grow food in the world. So could we do the same thing? I'm going to now make a, not just the fuel, my fuel is going to be a plastic, and I'm going to keep the plastic inside the bug. So it's going to take sunlight, split water to hydrogen, combine it with CO2, but I won't make a liquid fuel. I'll make a plastic fuel and keep it inside the bug. And then the bug can draw on the plastic, the hydrogen, the energy supply from water splitting, solar water splitting. And the question is, could we make fertilizer? So we made a bug. This is a different one, a xanthobacteria. In, in one pathway, it's fixing CO2 to make solid biomass. And then it draws on this biomass, the plastic, to run a different enzyme called the nitrogenase. And that takes nitrogen to ammonia. And you can prove it. Here's the bug, it's growing. Here's the bug, it's growing. And you start to see all of it in solid biomass. Then we put a small molecule in the biosynthetic pathway. When you make ammonia, ammonia gets forward propagated to enzymes, I'm done, enzymes and proteins. So when I put the small molecule block in, you can start to see ammonia being produced. And that's what I need to do fertilization of. So now what we can do, and these bugs make a lot of ammonia, 9.1 times 10 to the 9th per cell, mole equivalents of ammonia. So now we have this bug. We use the solar part, like I told you, separate. That I need the sun for it. I make a bioplastic. And then once I've done that, I've bottled sunlight inside plastic. The bug doesn't need to see sunlight or water anymore. I can put it in the ground, and then it uses that, its energy supply, to take nitrogen and make ammonia. So here's the bug. That big white thing is a vesicle of polyhydroxybutyrate. It's now its internal solar supply. And I can put the bugs in the ground, and I can grow crops. So this bug is in the ground in the Harvard Arboretum, and I'm growing big radishes. Bad business model. Massachusetts just voted for, a, it's a marijuana state. I'm going to grow big marijuana plants and become rich. And we're seeing big increases in dry weight. It's exactly what Professor Chu was talking about yesterday, this mixture of crop fertilization but solar driven. So we did all that, but I want to just highlight it. I'll have to start with proton coupled ET. There's only one thing I know well, how an electron talks to a proton. Okay. Finally, just to end, how do I move this to the poor? This is also an experiment. So the reason I moved to Harvard is I made a deal with them. Anything I invent, I own the IP. Harvard doesn't. I can do what I want with it. So that means give it away for free. It's protected, 
but it's given to this place, Institute of Chemical Technology in India and in Mumbai. They're a really good engineering school. Then, with Michael Greenstone and Rahini Pandey and a thousand power plants in India, we have little helium neon lasers in all those stacks. And in real time, we're monitoring the PM, the particulate emission that Professor Chu was talking about yesterday. With three states, we have an agreement to do cap and trade. And what that does is it generates revenue, which we're now sending over to there because these guys are now building big pilot scale-up plants. Until you make a pilot, it's impossible to predict how well something's going to work. So this is a different, this is also an experiment to try to fund research to take science to a pilot to do scale-up. We'll see if it works. And then we have some investors in India, not in America, who then can invest in this and then take it back to their company because I'm not owning the IP and trying to make money off of it. So whatever they invest, they get back into their company. So I was able to raise $20 million in one hour because the wealthy person in India, I said, if you put $20 million here, whatever they develop, you get to use it in your company. And then I won't get in the way and Harvard won't get in the way. So we'll see if that business model works for doing technology transition for this type of science. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>